Okay, good, uh, good evening everybody, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, here in Glasgow and those of you watching online. My name is David Ainsworth and I'm the Information Officer for the Secretary of the Convention on Biological Diversity. Uh, I'm very pleased today to be with you for this side event on advancing one health through the articulation of linkages between biodiversity, climate change, desertification, uh, and health. Uh, it's great to have a great audience here at the end of Nature Day here in Glasgow and it's great to see this audience uh, on board as well. So the event we're holding today is organized in the Jeff uh, and GCF Pavilion uh, here at COP26 at Glasgow. So thanks very much to the Jeff uh, and the GCF for putting this together. Um, this event is organized under the uh, rubric of the Real Conventions Pavilion, which is a joint outreach opportunity uh, organized by the UNFCCC, the UNCCD, the Convention on Biodiversity, uh, with the assistance uh, of the Jeff. So today, the event you're going to look at is going to be discussing how One Health provides a common agenda for accelerating progress in, um, in restoring our relationship with nature and looking at the common drivers of climate change, land degradation, and biodiversity while we can support the achievement of health and well-being for all. So for us to open the conversation, it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Dame Sally Davies, who is the United Kingdom Special Envoy on Antimicrobial Resistance, AMR, and a formal Chief Medical Officer, the CMO, for England, and also the Chief Medical Advisor to the United Kingdom Government from March 2011 to September 2019. Uh, Dame Sally Davies is joining us virtually, and she'll be delivering a keynote address on the intricate links between the health of people animals and the environment and should be looking at it through the lenses of antimicrobial resistance. So uh, Professor Dame uh, Davies, uh, the floor is yours. David, um, let me say to all of you, if you go away from this with one message, then it, for me, it is that you need to remember that anti-infectives are a finite source, antibiotics and antifungals in particular and that they are essential to our lives, to our biodiversity, our food systems, our water systems, and our health. And we know that no ecosystem is secure unless we get all of these in balance sustainably. We know that antibiotics, antifungals, anti-infectives cure many people and, and are underpinning modern medicine. But as I said, they're a finite resource and our excessive consumption of antibiotics to meet the demands of intensive disease prone farming systems and toxic complex pharmaceutical production is driving resistance and leaving us medically defenseless. Meanwhile, it also destroys biodiversity and compromises animal welfare and security. Like climate change, AMR, antimicrobial resistance, impacts productivity, mortality, poverty, and the health of everyone, whether human, animal, or the environment. We've already got over a million people dying every year from drug-resistant infections. This is going to go up and reach probably 10 million by 2050. And like climate change, AMR is going to have a disproportionate economic consequence for developing countries. You know, it's not a new problem at all, but it is going up because our global systems are failing. Globally, over 80% or at least up to 80% of all antibiotics are used in farming because they're cheaper than cleanliness, than good animal husbandry and farm hygiene. And as our global population increases and the global demand for cheap protein, more of these antibiotics are going to be pooed and peed out ending up in fields and waterways. In communities where we haven't got wastewater treatment, fecal matter goes directly into surface and groundwater, often through open drains. So the most vulnerable across our world, living in places without sanitation, are exposed to AMR. And that's even when they haven't got access to the treatments they need. And we know the evidence is mounting that antibiotics are polluting our waterways. There was a large study last year looking at antibiotics in water and over two thirds of 700 samples from rivers around the globe had antibiotics in them. So whether it's from poo, pee, pharmaceutical manufacturers and their factories leaking their waste into water 
or fish farming, the marine environment spreads resistant bacteria to places that it really shouldn't be. We found AMR in the Arctic Circle, in remote Galapagos Islands, in the Amazon, just to name a few. And so we have to worry. And it's aggravated, we discover, by marine plastics, which look to spread drug-resistant microbes through our seas and oceans, exacerbating biodiversity loss at the same time as antimicrobial resistance. You know, our um, behaviors are mortgaging the health of our planet. The World Health Organization have warned that the world is failing on AMR, and the UN Environment Programme points to human ignorance and carelessness for the development of these superbugs. How much will our children have to pay the price for all of this and the systems they inherit? And that depends very much on what we do now. We're all connected and we need to have equity between generations and countries as our path forwards. So as you do your work at COP and hereafter, please remember that as you transform food systems to be more resilient, sustainable and equitable, we've got to use this opportunity, not only to realize the SDGs on food security, clean water and sanitation, as well as health coverage, but we need the value of nature to be embedded in the global approach to AMR with sustainable conservation and development going hand in hand. We've got to have this integrated, specific and cost effective set of solutions to drive quality and sustainability. AMR has to be a shared responsibility for all UN organizations. And after all, you influence the major trends and systemic shifts. You can put AMR across all your programs. So we want everyone to sign up to the 2021 UN call to action on AMR. Multilateral momentum's high, but we know, only, we know that only action will spare the poor and our planet from social and economic costs that would make COVID-19 pale in comparison. AMR is the slow pandemic. Our UN um, One Health Global Leaders Group on AMR, of which I'm honored to be a member, is catalyzing political action and innovation. We're calling for evidence-based sustainable alternatives to antimicrobials across all systems, and we're urging for a high-level meeting on AMR during UNGA 2024. And we need more evidence. Look how well the IPCC has worked. We need the establishment of the independent panel on evidence for action against antimicrobial resistance. We need a panel to give voice to AMR. And remember how the challenges of AMR and climate change are linked. So we've got to tackle them with the same levers and more impetus. And that's actually why under the UK's G7 presidency, we've got health and climate ministers working together to build up understanding of AMR in our environment. I think COVID-19 has shown the value of inclusive growth and going forward, we've got to make sure medicines are affordable and available. And so we're working also with finance directors, banks and private investors to leverage financing for investments that benefit AMR. We've launched at the World Economic Forum with um, the FAIR, the NGO, and, and uh, PRI, the investor action on AMR. We call on investors to make sustainable investments and incorporate AMR into ESG. But it's going to take more innovative and integrated approaches at local, national, and global levels, whether it's like we have in the UK, new DNA sequencing, or Thailand's monitoring of antibiotic residues in aquaculture, and India's efforts to legislate on standards for environmental pollution from AMR. The world's beginning to build a One Health approach to AMR, but we've got to do better. We want to pass on sustainable health systems, sustainable food systems, and a planet to our next generation. So here, at COP, we see what multilateral action can achieve for the good of the planet. And as I said at the beginning, to all of you here today, help us get this right for antimicrobial resistance. We look to you. We need this momentum on AMR, just as it is for climate change. Everyone has a role in this. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Professor Dame, Sally Davies. Uh, your comments really do raise uh, eloquently the importance of looking at the environmental dis uh, dimensions of antimicrobial resistance. And this anti issue of antimicrobial resistance really reminds us of the need of incorporating environmental divisions, uh, dimensions within One Health approaches, a topic that the panel we have uh, will now address by looking at the various environmental determinants of health that are linked with biodiversity loss, climate change, and land degradation. So the panel, it's my pleasure to, uh, to introduce, uh, will be led by Mr. Ali Raza Rizvi, who's the Program Manager for Ecosystem-Based Adaptation at IUCN. And Ali's been promoting environmental conservation and human well-being over the last two decades. Um, Ali, the panel is yours to moderate. Go ahead. Thank you, David. The interlinkages between land degradation, climate change, and biodiversity loss are directly impacting human health. And the COVID pandemic made us aware again, very in a drastic manner, that these interlinkages need to be appreciated, understood, and planning needs to be done around it. One Health overall has been, you know, over two decades that work has been done. But somehow, environmental angle has been marginalized in some things. CBD, very appreciately, has recognized that since 90s and then also did a lot of technical papers and other, but COVID is, you know, unfortunate event has made us look, if we look into the world and our problem, human well-being, in a unilateral way, things cannot be addressed. Billions of dollars are going into climate adaptation, other aspects, but still, if we do just one aspect, Overall, human well-being and ecosystems, they are all interlinked. So that's what we will be discussing today. And you know all that One Health is that the overall outcomes of that approach help environment, help humans and animals in an integrated manner. So that would be our overall, the gist of the discussions today. And we have a very good panel who would be with us today, some in person, some uh, in virtual. And I would like to introduce uh, Ms. Louise Baker, who is the Managing Director of UNCCD, and uh, uh, they support country-level implementation and resource mobilization for desertification. And then, uh, hopefully, Ms. Coco Warner, who is with UNFCCC, uh, should be joining us soon. And uh, she guides the Adaptation Knowledge Hub at UNFCCC and uh, scaling up adaptation action in local communities and indigenous people platform. And Dr. Sienna uh, Nathan Yahoo would be joining us virtually. And she is the program manager for environment and health impact assessment at the European Center for Environment and Health of WHO, based in Bonn. And Ms. Gustavo Fonseca is with here, who is the director of programs at Jeff, and oversees and manages technical and administrative team in charge of programming and dispersing over one billion annually. And uh, de-risking finance is and directed to pro projects and programs in over 150 developing countries. And then. We have Mr. David Cooper, who's a Deputy Executive Secretary of CBD, and he leads uh, strategic planning activities of the Secretariat, as well as the intergovernmental processes and activities under the convention. So first, we would start with just very brief intervention on that how the organizations are working to integrate environmental dimension into One Health in particular when it comes to biodiversity loss, climate change, and land degradation. So first, I would request Dr. Netanyahu, who is online, uh, to have the floor. Thank you very much. Um, so indeed, I think that uh, the moderator, you're very right. I mean, it's not a new concept. It's, all, it's not a new approach, but um, the the... The issue is really um, how we bring it into mainstream, the, to the mainstream, and how we are keeping uh, in a consistent way to to look into the, the interconnections in uh, uh, within the the One Health approach. So, what WHO um, 
is done um, in 2020. They published at the global level a strategy for health and environment and climate change, where we acknowledge the consequences of global environmental change, including climate change and biodiversity loss, and having also the important role of, um, of that in human health. Also in uh, 2021, the manifesto uh, was uh, published by WHO following uh, the healthy recovery, I mean, or, pro or promoting healthy recovery from COVID-19, where the first prescription uh, for actionable was, was, was nature, was how we protect nature. So this was the number one, and this is uh, quite um, outstanding for, um, for a health organization. Uh, also, in the regional level, I should mention a few actions. Uh, in 2021, there is the tripartite at the level, at the European level, also joined by UNEP, um, are advancing uh, the, uh, the coordination in, in One Health. In the center, in the Bonn Center for uh, European Center for Environment and Health, we do have a mechanism through all ministries of health and ministries of environment. And the last time we've met in Ostrava in 2017, the member states um, gave, um, gave us the mandate to promote environmental degradation in human health and results, and also um, prevent, uh, to re uh, and, sorry, to prevent uh, diseases related to environment, including pollution, climate change, and improving uh, sanitation, healthy cities, etc. I would like to mention uh, finally three other items: the Pan-European uh, Commission on Health and Sustainable Development that was. Uh, uh, put in place by uh, the regional director, which was also called the Monte Commission, also uh, recommended that one health approach must be taken into account in relation to sustainable development. And finally, here in the center, we have worked uh, quite closely in recent uh, the recent months on uh, a publication on nature, biodiversity of health, uh, also another publication on space, green space and mental health but also on the, the role of the environment um, in One Health approach. Uh, this is a, a, a work that we are uh, dealing with now uh, to look into really the, the impact of uh, the environment. And, and it has been really neglected in recent years and also um, in the literature. So we are trying to put this together at the moment. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Netanyahu. Uh, it's so critical that you know, One Health and all these elements, we need to invest very directly because that's what is happening. We are so much siloed and a lot of expertise is available in different organizations. So that's the key, as Dr. Netanyahu also pointed out, this is being addressed, it's there, but still we need to move forward with One Health element into climate change. We will come back to you later also, Dr. Netanyahu. Now, floor is with David Cooper, uh, over to you. Thank you very much. And um, actually, a number of years ago, CBD work, working closely with WHO, actually in work um, led by Christina Romanelli, we did a major study on looking at the interlinkages between biodiversity and health. So really looking at what are the dimensions of, 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 of this issue. Obviously, looking at issues of uh, infectious disease, but also non-communicable disease, looking at the role and importance of biodiversity in, um, in nutrition, but then also looking at the role of biodiversity in supporting you know, how you deliver that nutrition through agricultural practices and the like. Also put a focus on trying to understand the ecological and evolutionary aspects of how of, of this interface between between biodiversity and health, which we when when that goes wrong, it, we see the sort of things that um, Dame Sally was talking about just now, with with respect to antimicrobial resistance, and in a sense, we also see it now with the emergence of. Um, not just a COVID-19 pandemic, but a, a number of zoonotic diseases that have emerged uh, over the years. Um, and then also, as was mentioned in the introduction, to look at the common drivers of these environment-related health issues, climate change, land degradation, and biodiversity loss. We um, have then also developed some guidance on integrating biodiversity considerations into One Health approaches. And that was developed and uh, presented to the Conference of the Parties 
a, a, a COP14, the CBD conference of parties at COP14 in Sharm el Sheikh, uh, and, 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 and welcomed. And we built on that actually in the um, Global Biodiversity Outlook that was published in 2020, looking at the one health transition as, as, as a change really in, in approach that, that needs to be part of the, trans, transform, the transitions that we need to have um, um, towards the post-2020 um, framework. So uh, I'll just say one other thing, working with WHO was to try and bring better understanding between the constituencies, the health constituency and the biodiversity or environmental constituency um, through a number of, of tools, but also for a number of uh, regional workshops that WHO and, and CBD co-organized. Thank you, David. Biodiversity loss, you know, directly impacts human well-being, as we all know. And that's where, you know, when, as I will repeat myself, because that's where, you know, we are failing in adaptation, that we only look sometimes in, you know, one-dimensional aspect of the adaptation. Let's work on, you know, built environment or ecosystems and other. But if we look at each other's, you know, resilience, it's not just nature. It's also together with nature, access to health and other aspects. And when land degradation happens, especially local communities, their traditional, you know, medicines and other also get compromised. So that's again, access to food security and all those. So that aspect needs to be addressed also in adaptation elements and land degradation. So now we have uh, Louis Baker, Ms. Louis Baker with UNCCD who would talk about land degradation, its impact on human health and ecosystems. So over to you, Ms. Louise Baker. Thank you so much. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. Hello. Um, actually, this is probably my perfect event. I used to work for WHO in the TB team when we discovered a, a really serious form of drug-resistant TB. So it's very close to my heart, this. Um, and the the, really the two sides of the same coin when we're talking about health and nature they have to go hand in hand um, at, at UNCCD it's it's really basic actually in by 2025 1.8 people are going billion people are going to be living in a situation of um, absolute water scarcity drought is increasing um, with the uh, very basic health implications, dehydration, infectious spores diseases, uh, vector-borne diseases like dengue and malaria increasing, um, the food uh, insecurity uh, problems, both in terms of deficiency and in terms of increase in food prices as land productivity goes down. Um, we also have issues associated with land degradation and sand and dust storms. So as the land becomes drier and um, storms come in, the particulates in the air, increasing risks for meningitis and respiratory diseases. Um, yeah, and let alone the socioeconomic factors, loss of employment, uh, loss of livestock and migration associated with um, land degradation, desertification, a sort of push factors from the land making people move. And this has huge implications, I think, for healthcare provision. It has huge implications for actually the healthcare services themselves when water is not available. So we are absolutely committed to this. The, uh, there was a very interesting round table during our recent COP of ministers, which looked at these issues to see how we could try to get the idea of land and nature in better balance, focusing mostly on the restoration agenda, looking at how we can restore the health and productivity of the land to boost production and to ensure its kind of, its viability for, for nature and for people. Uh, there's quite a lot of work around migration that's going on. So, so sort of managed migration that populations who can 
manage their land properly have more of an option to stay in their local communities and strengthen their local communities and then working around sand and dust storms and around drought and that's quite interesting in that those issues are moving into a quite in drought moving into something more proactive so that communities can prepare for drought and build their resilience more early warning systems more sort of holistic approaches to it and then with sand and dust storms uh, focusing perhaps on the restoration agenda i guess our sort of niche at unccd is that those source areas trying to identify those source areas for sand and dust storms anthropogenic sand and dust storms and trying to restore those so that we can reduce the threat factors so from from our side it's it's integral to what we do and the people within the landscape are integral to what we do. So we're delighted to work in any way. And I think this is a, an area where health, nature, imbalance ha, has got to be something that we do jointly. Um, yeah, and there's a lot, a lot in this space that can be done more. So happy to collaborate and happy to work with all the colleagues on this. It's an exciting, exciting but challenging area. Thank you so much for the opportunity to make an intervention. Thank you, Ms. Baker. Desertification and all these elements, you know, directly land degradation, you know, we know the topsoil being lost in millions of tons every year and climate change is impacting directly and that not only impacts soil biodiversity, but all the whole, you know, cycle of nutrition element and food, all those, you know, impacts human health. So with climate change and you know, impact on how knowledge can be transferred and knowledge hub, what at UNFCCC is doing about it through the knowledge hub with Coco, you guides the whole direction of it. So over to you for your intervention. Ali, thank you so much. And it is a total pleasure to join you. And of course, all of us, CBD and UNCCD, Louise at home and gentlemen, um, we've been working it feels like tirelessly, but we've been working together for many years to try and move from awareness of, yeah, there's something going on in the world. We need to do something about climate change, about health, biodiversity, our soils, to acceptance that, yeah, not only do we know that there's a problem, we also accept that um, there's some solutions that need to be taken up and finally action. And I think that that last point, that action, is what brings all of us here together at COP26. And it will keep bringing us together on Monday, the 16th of November, when we're all back at home, back at our desks or back on our farms or wherever we are. This is a constant effort. So it's really exciting. Thank you. A couple of days ago, many of us sitting here together, maybe not you gentlemen, we'll, but we'll invite you next time. We're talking about adaptation and resilience and biodiversity. And as I've heard so far, um, and as all of you know, biodiversity and ecosystem health are a fundamental part of all of our well-being. Sometimes we think about health as, I feel sick, I'll go to the, depending on where you're from, and like fixing symptoms. And we know now at the latest with the pandemic that wellness is a holistic concept. It's not waiting until things break down. It's taking care of things and repairing and restoring. Um, and that is not just our human health, it's the health of everything that we're in. And actually this is, this is all of your world. And um, when it comes to adaptation knowledge, and acceptance and action. The work that we're doing at UNFCCC has so much benefited from all of your work. We feel your fingerprints. So <laughs> first of all, I'm sorry that I came and was just sitting here. I'm literally just clearing text because we're hours away from the closing plenaries of this first week's very busy week of work. Um, and so there's so much to talk about, but maybe I can just say a few things of where health and biodiversity fit into what we're doing right now live here in Glasgow and, and the time ahead. So one of the work streams, which the text was literally just cleared um, just in a, in a meeting a couple of hours ago, has to do with adaptation to knowledge and Ali and of course CBD um, and many of you have been part of that. 
delegates came together and said, all right, for countries to scale up action and to really do adaptation on the ground, there are knowledge gaps. We need to know what do people on the ground need? Um, what does all of this, climate negotiations, our finance institutions, all of the UN family, what do we need to do to work together, not just to fill knowledge gaps, but to make sure that the link is made to those who will enact um, adaptation. And so again, it's that knowledge, acceptance, action. It's that whole thing together. And so parties in the text that you guys will see, if you're interested, um, have said, all right, we need to know what do the knowledge users actually need? Who's important to them? And to give just one analogy, it's not necessarily climate change, but if you can imagine in the world of public health, Science and practice show us that it's a good thing if mothers of newborn infants breastfeed their children. And that's not a widespread pra practice all over the world. And so there are knowledge campaigns. And a knowledge campaign that's targeted at a new mother, that's something that's been quite typical all over. But what we're finding from research and practice is that targeting knowledge to the people around your target who are interesting, like mothers-in-law, that's actually the person who needs the knowledge. If a mother-in-law, maybe a mother too, of a mother with an infant who was just born actually says, so daughter-in-law, to be a good woman in our household, you actually need to breastfeed your child. Sorry, I think this is something you may not relate to, but if any of you are mothers, you might relate. Mothers-in-law have tremendous influence on their daughters-in-law for a variety of reasons. And that's something, okay, maybe not in the realm of public health, but in the realm of adaptation, we're also learning. And all of you are, are going to be part, part of that. Where does biodiversity come in? It's very similar. Um, all of, some communities live closer to a, a more natural or less built environment than others. And it's really essential to understand what does adaptation mean for those people who are stewarding nature, such as indigenous people? And that's why here at COP26, you see so many indigenous experts um, and you'll be hearing from them. And that's also a really important part of our work. It's been part of the negotiations here. I could give additional, uh, additional examples, but I, what I'm just trying to say is that the measure of our success at the climate negotiations and the time beyond in building a holistic, healthy environment for people, for, the, for other living neighbors, really relies on getting the people here who take the action and understanding what they need, also inviting them to share their knowledge and their experience, and then paving the path forward. We'll, we'll have successful agreements here, but the next step is above you know, our agreements, the acceptance, uptake, and action. Thank you, Coco, and uh, wishing you good luck for the tax clearance and all this, and it would be great to have a holistic approach. And when it comes to holistic approach in knowledge, and then it also requires then financing so that the implementation on ground can be done in a holistic manner, and that's again a big challenge. You know, first is, to appreciate the problem, get the required knowledge that how best we can do adaptation and address climate change, and then it becomes resourcing of it. So Gustavo, how Jeff, GCF, you know, trying to address and include One Health in its fund disbursements? Well, thank you very much. Uh, a lot has been said already about the uh, interconnectedness of, uh, of uh, the environmental dimensions that uh, the conventions that uh, have been created and the Jeff serves uh, have. And this, these connections, uh, we are here under the banner of the Rio Conventions Pavilion, which has been an effort uh, at every CBD COP and now at the Climate Change COP and also we held in the CCD to try to bring uh, the message that uh, the environment uh, and the different dimensions of the environment are highly interdependent and we cannot really hope to address one without uh, addressing the others and working with them in, in combination. We also need to understand if there are trade-offs 
between uh, these uh, these objectives that we decide and these commitments that we have across different conventions. So this work about uh, third, uh, additional integration uh, on funding lines that we provide to countries to meet their commitments with the with the different conventions that we serve uh, has evolved uh, uh, over the years, and now we uh, got to a point where we are we are really proposing to uh, our next replenishment cycle that's being negotiated at this stage that we have integration as our uh, uh, beacon on the hill. Uh, let's uh, do integration as much as we can because we know that uh, these problems are systemic in nature and they require systemic solutions. So what does all of that has to do with human health? Uh, up to now, it hadn't anything to do with human health because our goal uh, we are a convention that, so we are a financial mechanism that serves conventions. In our mandate, we are not a development institution. Our mandate is to provide funding for the generation of global environmental benefits. It's about the atmosphere, it's about uh, reducing land degradation, reducing deforestation. And of course, these have uh, consequences for human well being, but we haven't really before made the connection between human health, emerging diseases, and uh, the work that we fund and, uh, and the projects that we have. Come COVID, right? Comes like you know, a, a punch in the face and said, look, here we are. Uh, what are we gonna do about it? I remember clearly that uh, it was in February of 2019 that we had to close the office and, uh, and we started getting calls from our donors asking, uh, what triggered this uh, this outbreak? What are you going to do about it? Uh, what are you going to do about preventing future pandemics? We hear that this is a this is a, a problem that was uh, generated by the consumption and trade of uh, wildlife. We provide financing to you to combat this kind of thing, and still, you know, we are faced now with this global problem. So we we, we are really failing in our mission. Uh, and that will kind of trigger immediately uh, uh, a reassessment of, and we were in the middle of beginning, no, no, sorry, beginning to develop our strategy. And we convened what we call the COVID-19 uh, task force. And we brought development agencies, we brought uh, health institutions, we brought uh, NGOs and say, what do we know about these interconnections? Of course, we knew for a long time uh, from science that there are direct consequences uh, in terms of uh, uh, diseases and, and, uh, and environment. For example, deforestation has been linked to, uh, with a, a more deadly form of malaria in the Amazon for a long time. So we know about that. We know that uh, waterborne diseases are a problem, particularly if you, if you deforest, if you degrade land. Uh, we, we know that uh, as you deforest, you get exposed to arbovirus uh, outbreaks. We see this throughout Latin America. We knew about Ebola, we knew about MERS, we knew about SARS. And, and why haven't we thought about that from a comprehensive uh, uh, perspective in trying to link what we were doing in integrating financial uh, packages uh, dealing with uh, multiple benefits on biodiversity, climate change, and land degradation to the health aspect of this? And suddenly we realized that uh, we are, were really uh, uh, not equipped to uh, articulate that the message that in order to have healthy people, you need to have a healthy planet. And uh, under this, uh, this banner of a healthy planet, healthy people, we are developed our strategy for the next uh, four years. And through that, we are embedding what we, are, we, we adopted as the One Health approach. But as we looked more in depth at the One Health approach, we realized that it was very limited uh, in, in terms of what what it, it, it describes and what it, 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 it's not really a comprehensive approach that we need to address. So we are now uh, in the verge of, a, 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 of a publishing a peer reviewed publication with the task force that tries to stimulate a discussion about how can we uh, expand the notion of One Health to embrace all of these interlinkages that exist between the different dimensions of the environment and human health. So I think that with that, it's going to be easier for, I think, society to understand that we are reaching the limits of the planet, not only uh, the limits of uh, 
food security, you know, clean water, but also our own health. And, uh, and the pandemic, you know, it's a clear, stark example. And if that lesson is not really uh, uh, well understood, I think we're going to be in a big problem, you know, uh, a few years from now. So I think we need to embrace this and embed in everything that we do, uh, this notion that uh, uh, human health depends on a healthy environment. Thank you, Gustavo. It's so critical, as you said, that we need to have integrated approach. And great to see that you know, you are revising and looking into through scientific knowledge to guide funding processes. So we will go a little bit now deep in the second round, and I will come to you all again that how you know we can move forward in a holistic manner because you know it is challenging to appreciate a problem. Many a time we remain in denial, but COVID hit us so hard, and as you said, you know, punch in the face that we have to think that business as usual is not working. So that is critical to first appreciate whatever we have been doing in the last decades in order to address climate change, it was not enough. And that's the reason we have the world we have now. Half the world is burning, wildfires, heat waves, other half is under floods. So all these things, how best we can move forward. So I'll come back to you all now and uh, starting with David, you, uh, that biodiversity loss, climate change, degradation, negative outcomes, share the you know, same root cause, underlying causes are same. That how unsustainable production, consumption, land management, you know, can you share your views how ecosystem-based approaches or nature-based solutions can help us to address these underlying causes? Because until and, you know, if we can keep removing the symptoms, but if we will not hit the root cause, things will come back to the same problem. Yes, sir. Yeah, thank you. And yeah, I think the things that Gustavo were just, the problems Gustavo was just outlining, they are all an indication that we're just putting the natural world and the relationship between people and the natural world under too much strain. And so the response the opposite is also true, that by looking at um, adaptation to, to climate change, uh, looking at uh, combating land degradation, at looking at conservation of biodiversity, we're, do, we're doing essentially the same things, or at least we, we should be. And these are very, very closely in, interlinked things that will also reduce, if, if done in the proper way, will reduce the risks of not only a future pandemics, but other, uh, but outbreaks of crop diseases and, and all sorts of other AMR, all sorts of other issues as well. So I just want to highlight three areas. I mean, one is on looking at conservation and restoration, but in the context of broader spatial planning. So where do we do things? Where do we allow development? Where do we allow infrastructure development? Are there some areas where we particularly need to prevent encroachment of, um, of, of cities, of, of large um, populations of people into certain ecosystems? How do we um, design our cities also to be, 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 be more healthy? And in this, yes, we should look at risk of diseases, emerging zoonotic diseases, but we also need to look at the other services that nature provides, whether that's clean water, um, erosion control um, uh, as well. So really much more emphasis on this spatial planning is the first thing. The second thing is looking at how we manage uh, agricultural production systems, the crops uh, and livestock and uh, aquaculture also. Um, and, you know, what we heard earlier about AMR, you know, we've seen conceptually very similar things when we look at um, our approaches to pest control on farms. Um, you know, in 
whenever it was, the 60s, when it, we're expanding um, hugely um, rice production in, 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 in Asia, for instance, there was emergence of, um, of, of diseases like black, brown um, rice, uh, brown plant hopper, other, other diseases, and we, we threw at them basically chemicals, pesticides. And at first they seemed to work. But then we found that um, the, the pests become resistant to, to, the, to the pesticide. And meanwhile, you've killed all the natural enemies of those pests. And so you get actually a resurgence of, um, of, of these pest outbreaks. Instead, we need to invest actually in the biodiversity, in the, the natural enemies of those, of those pests. And the same applies to, to, to two diseases. So looking at these sort of investing in these agroecological approaches in this case, for instance, can be a way that we can minimize um, the risk of um, harm to people from, from pesticides, harm to the environment to, from pesticides, and improve the stability of, of production and actually increase production. Um, and there's a, lot of, there's a lot of case history of this. Um, there will be a, um, an assessment that IPBES will be doing on looking at the nexus of biodiversity, health, water and food, um, actually also in the context of climate change. And I hope that they will be able to delve into some of, some of these things as well. The third element is looking at, at consumption levels. So even if we improve our production practices, even if we do things in the right places, there's still a limit if we are not have, having some control over, over consumption. This may be very specific in the case of um, consumption of, 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 of some, some form of wildlife which are particularly risky in terms of disease outbreak, um, but also just excessive Overconsumption, for example, of meat drives that intensive livestock industry, which also is often an, uh, a source of or, or, or a secondary um, um, host for the transmission of emerging diseases. Um, so, looking at, 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 at getting a lid on, on overconsumption and this can be a win-win-win, by the way. It can be a win for human health, and it can be um, a win for um, uh, the environment and a, and a win for animal welfare. And then, of course, the other, um, uh, what should be low-hanging fruit is, is re reducing um, waste, uh, um, particularly um, um, food waste. At the same time, when we're looking at these consumption issues and we're looking at how we react, for example, to the pandemic and control um, consumption and wildlife trade, we must look, be conscious that many, many people depend directly on um, biodiversity for, for nutrition and, and always look to protect the customary sustainable use of, of, of biodiversity um, by indigenous peoples and local communities. And in fact, we worked uh, across a number of organizations through the collaborative partnership on wildlife management to develop some um, general principles on, um, uh, on um, managing wildlife trade, amongst other things, uh, in, in, a, in, a, in, the, in the context of a One Health approach. Thank you. Thank you, David. I know you have another commitment, so thank you for being with us and sharing CBD's view on this. So thanks a lot. Yeah. Uh, Coco, uh, you know, uh, WHO report now, you know, health argument is being getting momentum a lot. So how you see that in adaptation planning at national level and other, and your guidance to, you know, NAP and DCs and other, do you see how could it be further taken up at national level in adaptation planning, one health approach? Because this argument, the new report, which has been just released, you know, climate for climate action by WHO. Mm -hmm. So, in that light, any reflections? To, 
to kind of reiterate that idea of moving from awareness or knowledge to action, I think all of us have so much to learn about, oh yeah, actually, we do need to take nature into account. If Exactly as you were saying, I found that so interesting, Gustavo, in order to keep human society, and often since we're human, we kind of think about ourselves, but to keep our societies healthy, we also have to be good stewards of the environment upon which we vitally depend. And that awareness is growing. And now countries at this very high level, it's not just households, but at every level of our institutions, there's a growing awareness that, ah, that would mean that planning looks a little bit different. And obviously our important finance institutions and our health systems, but it goes farther. It goes to the way that, yeah, I already said um, planning because David had talked about spatial planning, um, but it also goes to participation, et cetera. So our, our whole, we're all moving a bit from awareness, like, oh yeah, nature, we do need to take care of nature. We can't just treat it as the receptacle for waste. We also need to cultivate it and, and learn how to take good care of it. We're now starting to accept that and, and question, ah, that would mean planning needs to look different. The means of implementation need to look different. And it's so encouraging to hear about, you may not think it's pioneering, but it sure sounds pioneering because you may have been doing this for a long time, but really making sure that all of the capacity and finance and technical or technologies are all aligned to really then get the action so that countries move from their national plans to national, very scaled up adaptation. We have a long way to go, but there's also a lot that we're learning from you, Ali. You share so much of the things that you're already doing. Um, so again, awareness, we have to accept a new way of doing things and then actually enact all of that in our adaptation and link that up with sustainable development and protecting all of these neat things that David was telling us that CBD is doing. And it's wholly possible. There's a lot of work to do and we need to do this work very quickly, but there's every reason to be optimistic. Thank you, Coco. It's heartening to see that CBD and UNFCCC and CCD, you know, all coming together and One Health can be a factor which can take forward this agenda. Uh, Luis, I'll come to you now that as a part of COVID post-recovery response, how you see land-based solutions and can help us for transition and towards sustainable land use and One Health inclusive approach? Thanks. Yeah, I mean, I, it's really interesting, isn't it? It's the, um, as Coco was saying there, I think very much how we move into making this happen on the ground. For us, probably, I would say there are three elements to that. One around rights, around actually, if you expect people to be good stewards of the land, which I think we do, whether they're farmers or, or indigenous communities, or they need the rights to the, the land so that they can they can care for it. So rights on the one hand, rewards, and that I'm gonna call that a sort of general term for sort of the taxes, incentives that we we give to things, the market signals that governments give, that they, they can give the right signals that promote this way of working that's integrated and holistic. They're not doing that yet. And so I, I think that kind of taxes, subsidies and incentives way of working um, would be an interesting one. We talk about a lot about fossil fuel subsidies, but there's also subsidies into the agricultural sector and into the kind of the sector that that is that sometimes drives degradation of, of uh, the natural world. And then, yeah, I think we would probably all agree with the responsibilities long term for long term vision on this, that you know, in, thing, in terms of geospatial planning, taking into account the rural urban, looking at kind of mapping where the choices and trade-offs are. So we're doing the right thing, the right place at the right time, and really developing tools that are decision support tools, real time, real world decision support tools that, that make the decisions for policymakers easier. So yeah, I think I'll stop there. Thank you so much.
explanation. Thank you, Shabhi. Louis. You very rightly said that you know subsidies and then you know changing of those subsidies to those areas where we need to give incentives for in the right area. So that's critical. So with those you know elements, Gustavo, I'll come back to you for this round that you alluded to that you know you are doing planning how to best integrate at the national level and because you know you finance all the three conventions how you see that this can be more integrated at the national level planning and other elements right uh when we started looking at this problem and how we could be useful to some extent because we are not a health organization we are not a development organization, even though, as we discussed in the first round, uh, all that we do has uh, relevance to, to human health. We noticed that uh, the One Health approach, as it's currently seen, it's pretty much linked to zoonotic diseases and uh, you know, consumption and, uh, of wildlife, uh, was too restrictive. And in order for us to start looking at this from a more holistic way, uh, we felt that uh, we could expand the One Health uh, uh, approach uh, according to a, ser a series of principles. First of all, we need to look at various scales. You asked about national. National is important, but we have to start when it comes to, to, to human health from the individual to the community to the uh, regional aspect and to the global, into the national and to the global, because the response also has to do with uh, all of these uh, different scales of, uh, of action. We need to move from, uh, need to start looking from genes to species to ecosystems. It's not just, you know, the, the, the viral particles that we're looking, but, you know, what are the vectors, how, how they interact, uh, as well as from local communities to cities to nation states. So this is the first principle. Secondly, we need, uh, and this is kind of obvious because we are talking about integration, we need to operate across sectors, across disciplines and practices, uh, including you know, human medicine, epidemiology, veterinary medicine. We heard from the professor uh, about uh, the uh, livestock issue with uh, resistance to antibiotics. And uh, I think that, and I, I think because uh, people in this field uh, are telling me that, that uh, the next threat doesn't necessarily come from zoonotic diseases coming from uh, wildlife and wild species, but more from livestock. And, uh, and, and, and that's going to be, you know, uh, an important problem that we need to address. So we need to look at this from that perspective as well. And sometimes we tend to uh, just uh, blame uh, uh, wildlife and wildlife consumption when, in fact, we are breeding animals in a very, very... Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, for, for some fair way, uh, unjust way, but also uh, uh, through systems that uh, we can really harm us badly. Uh, we also need to expand this from just uh, looking at uh, communicable diseases like, like influenza and like uh, uh, COVID, etc., to non-communicable diseases. We have a convention that we also serve, the Minamata Convention. It's about mercury. Mercury, uh, uh, the convention was created precisely because mercury is a toxic, a highly toxic pollutant that has tremendous uh, 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 potential to travel uh, globally and regionally. And uh, we all know about the famous Minamata disaster in Japan, the Minamata Bay. And uh, so we need to look at that too. And so addressing uh, environment, you're addressing to that. And also we need to look not just at uh, uh, wildlife or looking at diseases in uh, natural ecosystems on forests, but also on, on altered ecosystems. And the urban space is also important. So all of this is highly interlinked. So with that, we, we hope that we can trigger a new kind of thinking that matches what we are already doing in integrating biodiversity, climate change, land degradation, uh, and the chemicals agenda into something that we can articulate and, uh, and really push forward uh, efforts that will, uh, if not prevent, will enhance the uh, human health and uh, reduce the probability of outbreaks. And let me bring something to conclude here. Remember the old uh, principle that no one speaks anymore, but when the conventions came about, people talk about the preca precautionary principle. Remember that? It's better for us to, to uh, uh, try to, try to be... Uh, a little prudent than uh, going in frontiers that we don't know, right? That has been abandoned, and uh, now it became much more 
uh, technocratic as opposed to uh, to more holistic in the way that we approach things. But when it comes to zoonotic diseases, when it comes to uh, uh, issues that that are pandemic uh, or, or they have the potential to be pandemic, we can never really predict 100. percent We can we can provide some uh, some instances. We can monitor some hotspots of a of uh, diseases, but we cannot 100% prevent. So why not, and since we know that there are win-win-win uh, uh, outcomes out of uh, protecting the environment and managing the environment sustainably, and we all now know also that human health depends on that, why not protect just for the sake of it, and we're going to get a much better result than trying to uh, be much more, uh, let's say, um, Focused on individual diseases and uh, and trying to you know develop ten thousand different vaccines that no one likes to take. So thank you very much. Thank you, Gustavo, for these concluding remarks. That's really the gist of it. We need to have integrated approach. Look at all those things, not just on a one specific element. Uh, over the wall over here, there are some cartoons that disasters are collaborating much better way than we do. So, Sienna Netanyahu, I come to you that now we know that climate change, biodiversity loss, and you know, uh, land degradation, they all contributing towards one health elements. How can environment ministry, health ministries, they can collaborate? Your views on that, how can we promote that? Because we know their collaboration is critical. Yep. Thanks, Ali, for the question. First of all, I must say that I, um, I agree with every word that uh, was uh, said by uh, Gustavo. But um, in addition to what was said about scales of action, going from the individual to community, to the country level or city before that, and to maybe regional in terms of several countries and also international, I, I think that also in addition to this vertical way of looking into things, we also must combine it with the horizon, horizontal. Because I think where we fail is, is mostly with, between, is in, in coordinating among sectors within the same country. Um, what uh, we have been doing for 30 years in Bonn uh, to the Environmental Center for Environment and Health is where we are, we are collaborating with ministries of environment, ministries of health, also in collaboration with UNEC. Um, and we are promoting many environmental topics. Let it be chemicals, air pollution, noise, uh, urban health, etc. cetera. Um, in recent year, obviously climate change and all, obviously the old traditional topics like what? But even here, until recently, we never looked into the interconnection between all those sectors, all those disciplines. So, uh, and, and this is really important. And only in the last one or two years, we are really looking into more into the topics of biodiversity and issues related to um, loss of land and land degradation in general, and how it's also related to One Health. So, so first of all, how we are bringing the sectors together. And what we said today is much more beyond, it, it is, is beyond the sectors of ministries of health and ministries of environment. And the question is how we are going to be bold in order to operationalize One Health and call for action for other ministries as well. We talked about special planning, we talked about uh, agriculture, uh, it's much to do with the way we manage uh, the production of our energy, et cetera. Because One Health, as much as we want to say that it's, it's just also about the climate change, and this is the focus of, all, of the discussion today, climate change, biodiversity loss, and, and, and the land degradation and desertification, it's also a lot about uh, environmental pollution. So we need to bring all, all those into, into, um, into uh, the same, the same converse, converse, conversation um, and I must say that even though we have ex great experience with, for 30 years, it's not always easy to bring together both sectors. And, and, and we said today, we already need more than just the two sectors. So how we are breaking this silo operation, how we are going to, to bring together um, the understanding that we need to make sectors and disciplines, is, it's a craft. It's, it's something that we need to do 
beyond the regular things that we are doing, developing evidence, creating norms, uh, um, uh, documenting good practices, uh, etc. So there is an additional message that needs to be said. It's, it's how we are developing this leadership of promoting uh, intersectorial work. So what we've done in WHO uh, Europe is uh, we called for an operationalized um, program of how we are going to do in the next, what are we going to do in the next two years in order to operationalize One Health in the regional, in the regional level, uh, at the regional level, at the, at the multi-country level, but also in the country specific level. So the really what's behind that is really how we can establish um, routine ways uh, of working for um, working for um, the, the One Health um, approach, how we can mainstream the One Health approach across policies uh, within countries, within ministries, within the regions, etc. Uh, in addition to that, how we can promote tools, as as was uh, explained by Louise, um, tools for supporting, uh, uh, in this case, for example, surveillance. Um, how we can promote risk assessments all across sectors and the interconnections between activities in sectors. So things like this, I think we need to move from documenting to more, um, to more operation, to more of what actions need to be taken and how. That's okay. Thanks. Thank you, Siana. And you very rightly said that we need to move forward now and, you know, from talking about it to action, and that's the word is demanding us. So at this stage, uh, you know, I know, thank you all okay, who are still with us over a weekend late evening, but if you have any reflections, question, observation, so anything to you, David, would facilitate but well well just one thing we're actually running a little bit out of time so i think ali at this point in time it would be good to hear your reflections on the panelists comments you can provide your uh, wrap up and summary of the excellent things we've heard from everyone okay, okay. thanks and uh, miss lucy would also and and once you finish your wrap up then lucy will come and I she'll see. provide her closing right. remarks for the event now that's great good. okay so uh, we won't keep you long for your weekend evening so overall, we have seen that, you know, there is a lot of demand, you know, everyone, you know, we need to perhaps rethink our strategies for adaptation, for financing, for biodiversity loss, how to, you know, stop land degradation because everything is interlinked. We have tried to work on all these areas with all good intentions, but as they say, you know, the way to hell is paved with good intentions. So we need to perhaps relook at all intentions and see how practically we can move forward, break the silos, have an integrated approach in our knowledge generation, in our practice, have decision support tools. And you know, we COP26 is highlighting this very, you know, actively. Then CBD and CCD, COP15 also said about integration. So time is for action and integrated action and learn from our past mistakes and move forward with the new resolve because time is running out. It has already ran out on millions. So that's how we need to move forward. So thank you very much for all the panel discussion. Thanks a lot. And also those who are virtually joined us. So thanks a lot for that. So over to you, David. Great, thank you very much, Ali. Thank you so much for your moderation of this panel. And again, I'll repeat the thanks uh, for all of you for joining us. It's been good to hear this perspective from the three conventions and reflecting on what health, one health means. You know, is it really just about animal health? How can it be expanded? How can it be really looked at the other uh, environmental determinants of health? And how does it feed into the overall transformational agendas that we're looking at with regard to climate change, uh, land degradation, uh, and biodiversity loss? So what we'll do to to, to wrap this up is we'll have comments from Lucy Malenke. So Lucy has been with all of these processes for a long time, the climate change certification biodiversity process. Lucy is the co-chair of the International Indigenous Forum on Biodiversity, the IAFB. Um, a little bit, so Lucy Malenke is Maasai from Kenya. Um, she's also got many years of experience in community development work, uh, as well as the work under different Rio conventions. So uh, Lucy, let's hear your reflections and wrap up of our event for this evening.
Thank you very much, and thank you all panelists, uh, both who are here and also who are, uh, you know, uh, joined us uh, virtually. And uh, facilitator for really doing a good job in terms of bringing some of the aspects uh, on the ground. I think it's very important to uh, bring up the issue of the uh, health, one health, especially uh, focusing on indigenous peoples and local communities. Because for us, we look at these issues of health as something that is connected in linked with the, our environment with both the climate change we know that this is something that has caused a lot of problems for indigenous communities because of the change of the climate and everything desertification we have seen that we have had prolonged droughts right now in my continent africa and also in some other areas in india latin america and so on they are also facing a lot of uh, issues on drought we have also seen uh, issues of floods we have seen the issue of fires and so on, and uh, not far from uh, where we are in Spain and so on, with the volcanic uh, eruption and so on. All these uh, disasters, natural disasters, natural phenomena, they come with different uh, consequences. They come with different diseases. Even when we have floods in, floods in any country, it comes with its own diseases. But there is one thing that indigenous people are very keen on, on issues of health. Because this is something that for years, since our, uh, our elders and our forefathers, the first thing that was very important is always look at the health of the people on medicine that they take and also on the food. And it's all related. It's related with your environment. And that's why it's always keen, even at, lately when we had the pandemic, it was very easy for indigenous people to be able to revisit and look at different ways that they can be able to uh, prevent themselves and even be able to cure that. But as we see the, uh, the way the environment is evolving, it's also becoming a challenge because we are losing a lot of vegetation, we are losing a lot of biodiversity, that some communities have to go to borrow medicine or to look for medicine far away than normal. We have seen that there is a shortage of water, some people missing even water at all. Water is a crisis actually, and it should be discussed and looked at as we are looking of issues of climate. So it's very important to think of holistically as the, uh, you know, we were saying here, but also look at what are these issues that are affecting us? How can we integrate all of them and look at them together? So the discussion today, is very, very important. And we no longer look at health only with the WHO, but we look at it in different uh, uh, ways. And uh, as David Cooper had said, actually issues of health, indigenous people and the Convention on Biological Diversity had started uh, discussing it some years back. But again, as usual, there are some things that come in. We look at them and we don't really uh, see how we can be able to move on forward. We need to look at the recommendations that we have now. We need to see how these recommendations can be taken forward. Gustavo has, uh, comes from a, a financial mechanism, which already was very good for, for us to look at it during the COVID-19. But uh, we need to look at more. And I think Jeff has also got to look at this and integrate and, 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 and focus more on giving funding to us that direction, not only because uh, I think you've mentioned all the convention plus Minamata, which is of great concern to us because uh, uh, the small scale mining has caused a lot of damage and a lot of other diseases for communities. So let's, uh, I think it's very, very important. And one thing, recommendation that I want to give, apart from what we have said already, we have done a lot, but I think there is need for research. There is a need to look at those recommendations that we have already been looking at. And this research should not only be done by scientists alone. It's a high time you include indige indigenous people and local communities. Because at the local level, we are doing our own research on our own, uh, checking out on some of the things, even for vegetation that is disappearing, for vegetation that has already disappeared, that people can no longer have honey like it used to be before. So can we have and re revisit our way of life and see how much we can be able to do research and, and, and include indigenous people. I'm simply saying, leave no one behind. 
include all of us. A human rights approach is always very important and make sure that we also contribute to the process that we are in. So we are very glad and happy that uh, we are invited to look at the Rio conventions. They are very special to us, especially indigenous people, and we look at all of them very uh, keenly and very holistically. Thank you very much and I wish everyone uh, a wonderful time, and for you uh, going to write out the thing, I think this was a wonderful time to wind up, and you go back to your <laughs> discussion. Thank you very much, everyone. Bye. Great. Thank you very much, Lucy. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, as, as ever, you know, bringing together all of this, uh, the question of human rights, of equity, of traditional knowledge systems brought together, thanks so much. So I'd like to thank all the panelists. Thank you, Ali, for your facilitation. Thank you for those of you who joined us uh, remotely as well. Um, uh, it's a late Saturday here, so it's time for us to bring this to a close and take a bit of a rest before we continue. Thanks for joining us. Good night, everyone. Be safe. Thanks. <laughs>